He's the one who said to me, um, a lot of people in the West uh, think we're a museum. We're not a museum. You can't, uh, you can't tell us not to change. And you hear that and you, you know he's right. You just, you can't argue with that. Um, and I heard it uh, in several parts of, of the world. And it was one of the most challenging things I had to, to deal with is, uh, you know, it's like a commonplace. We don't want another strip mall. We don't want another highway. Uh, let's do mass transit. And, you, and you, you take that idea to these people who are just dying for pavement to cover the freaking mud that makes it impossible to drive my car half the year, and they don't, they don't want to know. They don't want to hear you. So, questions? Sure. Um, I'm sorry, I have a Yeah. I was wondering, this is part of what you were saying about um, people in the East telling Westerners that it, the East is a museum. Have you been to the Guel Tech at all, or, you know, Connemara in Ireland? Have you been, have you traveled any of the, those roads there? Because in it, Ireland? Yes, it's, it's very similar to what you're describing about Tibet. I was I, just wondering if you'd been. Mm, I hitchhiked from Dublin to the Ring of Kerry uh, one winter. And, uh, uh, but it wasn't... It, it didn't feel like a third world country to me. <laughs> As, but you're saying it is in a lot of ways? Uh, the Welltech is the, the part of Ireland where people primarily speak Irish. Okay. So it's it's... <laughs> It, it's a bit. If you, I, I don't know if Mr. Finnegan has been, but it's it's a bit different from from the Ring of Kerry. Yeah, Finnegan, mm. been to Ireland. I've been a couple times. Yeah, <laughs> and and the roads are are narrow and and scary, um, with the hedges and little cars whizzing along them, on the wrong side. Um, and I have actually. I'm, I'm not. I haven't been there enough to say very much about about Ireland, but. Um, there, I, I've seen since I first went there as a kid, um, uh, a kind of modernization that raises the exact same issues. I mean, there was a sort of housing subsidy available for a while that caused people to build um, little bungalows all over the country quite cheaply, which were, you know, modern places move out of a whitewashed farmhouse that that they might have lived in for many generations into a sort of less well situated I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this it's all over Ireland from what I've seen including all over the west um, and, and abandon this, this old farmhouse that's, that's deeply insulated and, and very sort of cleverly built into the landscape for some little place with sliding glass windows that looks awful and, and won't last very long and, and you want to as a Visitors say this is a terrible idea. This is a terrible idea. No, no, this is cleaner. It's easier to keep clean, and and you know there are obviously some some advantages, but um, uh, sort of disastrous for the picturesqueness and and the sort of organic connection people have to to where they live. So if if that's at all what you're talking about, and and I think road widening and new highways are are part of the same thing. But but the most striking part to me has been all the residential architectural. Um, upgrades <laughs> that are anything but upgrades to me. Yeah. Oh yes. Um, along that same line, uh, I was in Costa Rica a couple of years ago, and a remote village that has a very, very bad roads, very, very hard to get to, and no internet. And I was talking to a bunch of kids who live in the village, and. I said, which would change the village more, paving the road or getting internet? And they were unanimous that internet oh, that's would so. change the village a lot more. Yeah, interesting. Um, and I was just curious how that reflected on your experience. Yeah, well, th it's interesting to compare those those two networks. I mean, the um, obviously the internet is the uh, the you know. The, the latest gigantic transformative network, and uh, uh, and the sexier, I suppose. Uh, and yet, um, you know, without the road to bring the electricity, to bring the computer, to bring the Wi-Fi point, you you don't have that network. And so, uh, 
this structure, I guess, uh, is the underlying fundamental structure that makes other or network that makes other networks possible, and and is the most ancient. And yeah, it's funny. It's um, uh, I don't know. Maybe it seems like a a throwback to consider the idea of road networks right now. But the the world the world's villages are being connected to each other at a faster pace than ever, especially in Asia. I think uh, more than anywhere else, that's really happening. And uh, it just seemed worth worth looking at that that old fashioned network at the same time, though. Uh, I, I write early on, you know, because of the internet, the trip to China that would have taken me probably six months to organize 20 years ago, I was able to organize in about 10 days through IMing with uh, tour guides in Xi'an and uh, um, emailing the mother of my friend Kathy Hanauer, who had just been to Xi'an and knew that her guide had taken a self-driving trip. And anyway, uh, the, um, what's, uh, the, the, Guare's, uh, degrees of separation are, um, I, I think they're even fewer. I think every, every day it just, it all shrinks a little bit more. And, and it's the internet that do, that seems to be doing it the most dramatically, but, uh, but that depends on this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, wait, way back there. We'll come back to you. Yeah. Uh, have you traveled the road uh, from Bangkok to Siam Reap uh, through Cambodia? No, I haven't. I'd, I'd love to. You, you need to do that. <laughs> What's it like? Well, for three dollars, which is really a trick to get you enticed into getting into a bus so they can sell you a room in Siam Reap. It, it is the wildest road I've ever been on with traffic going to your left and your right, dodging each other. You'll see tractor trailers on a road that in places doesn't even look like a road. Mm. And it looks like you're crossing a muddy field. And then uh, the most interesting thing, though, we came to an iron bridge, which apparently was built back in the 40s. And we approached the bridge, and a man stepped out with a homemade uh, wand with a red uh, circle on it and stopped us. And said, you know, held out his hand. And so the bus driver, I said, do you, do you need money at this point? I mean, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, let's, let me give him $2. So he did that. And suddenly all these kids came out and put planks across the bridge. Ah. And then the br bus crossed the bridge. And I swore I thought we were going in. I, <laughs> I thought we were going to die. But. Uh, travel that road. It's it's exciting. You'll. I've, I've never done anything like it, and I've been all over. So next Put it on your list. next vacation, right? Thank you for your conversation. And the Taklamakan Desert, I think that I'm paraphrasing it means um, beware all who enter here, where whole cities have been swallowed up. Um, I was wondering whether there's a super highway that's about to cross it. It's the old Silk Route. I'm not sure exactly where on the Silk Route it is. Is it, is it now in you know western Kash China? Kashgar is? Uh-huh. Um, and Khotan? Uh -huh. K. H O T A N. Okay. And the desert itself, there have been um, there have been articles and books written about this, where yeah. whole cities are swallowed up, where um, it only takes like a few minutes for the entire area to be covered in uh, sand. Mm. And it's one of the most desolate places in the world, and it um, actually, I think, is. Uh, what you need to traverse before you actually can get to Tibet in some areas. Huh. And the oases, uh, oases, excuse me, were around the desert. I was wondering whether you know of any road that goes through the desert. I don't. In the 21st century. I don't. I'm not okay. sure it seems like a good idea to put a road there because it would be buried.